God is good. Oh, I've, I've just had a fantastic day getting some sun, I'm starting to get a little color after uh, going through the winter of uh, North Idaho. And I went for a slow jog in the woods on one of the trails and I had a chance to sit in a very hot sauna for about 45 minutes and then take one of those hot and cold showers. You know what that's like? And by the time you're done, I tell you, you're just revitalized. You're feeling good. So praise God. Glad to be here. Well, we're going to have quite a Bible study uh, this evening. This is part two of my series called Preparation for Earth's Final Crisis. And I'll talk more about that in the next few, uh, few meetings. But I'm really dealing with practical heart preparation and things that, that we really need inside of us. Uh, last night we talked about the beasts and the characters of the beasts. And I've been blessed that uh, many of you have come to me and said that that, that meeting really touched your heart. Uh, one lady walked up to me and after that meeting and she said, I need to go back to my room and get on my knees. And I thought, praise the Lord. Uh, that's what we want. We want the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and to go deep inside of us. Uh, the title of part two of my five-part series is called, In Their Mouth Was Found No Guile, based on Revelation chapter 14, verse, uh, verse 5. So let's pray together, and we're going to have a, quite a Bible study. We're going to go deep into the Word and see what God's Word has to say to us. So let's pray. Dear Father, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for, for Jesus and for the Bible and for the Holy Spirit that works among us and strives with us, speaks to our hearts and our consciences and convicts us where we need convicting and also comforts us where we need comforting. And Lord, we all need your help, especially me as I stand before uh, this, this group and those that are watching uh, on the internet, we just pray for the Holy Spirit, please, to be with us and to help us and to talk to us. Please help me in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, well, again, last night I talked about the beasts and the characters of the beasts and also the character of the Lamb. And ultimately, in order for us to be ready for what's coming, we need uh, the character of Jesus. We need more of Jesus. We need a lot of Jesus. We need as much of Jesus as we can get in our lives. Now, it's interesting, when you read the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation does not only talk about beasts, but it also talks about body parts. Maybe you've never noticed that, but it does. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, there's a vision of Jesus that John saw on the island of Patmos, and it talks about his head and his hair. His head and his hair were white like wool, white as snow. It also talks about, in verse 15, about his feet and different parts of his body. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2, and I'm just going to quickly mention these, uh, verses 7, 11, 17, and 29, it talks about the ears. Uh, over and over again, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, in chapter 4, verse 6, in chapter 5, verse 6, it talks about eyes. There are creatures up in heaven that have uh, many eyes. And there's a Bible verse that talks about uh, Jesus as a lamb, with seven horns and seven eyes. And I'll talk more about this on Sabbath. Uh, Jesus talks about the importance of, an, of anointing our eyes with eye salve so that we may be able to see, to see spiritual things. So Revelation talks about different parts of the body. And uh, tonight or this evening, I'm going to focus on one particular part of your body which is your mouth, the mouth. There's a lot in the Bible about the mouth, believe it or not. 
Uh, have, I'm sure you've probably heard of Muhammad Ali. Does that name ring a bell? He died, I think, about seven years ago. He was a world-famous uh, boxer. I believe he had a, a big house uh, just down the street from Andrews University. When I used to live there, we would drive by and people would say, that's one of Muhammad Ali's house, houses. And anyway, Muhammad Ali uh, had a number of nicknames, and one of them was The Mouth. Anybody remember that? They called him the mouth because he was very outspoken. Talked about uh, himself and about many things. And he also had another nickname. He was called the Louisville Lip. Because he was born in uh, Louisville or Louisville, Kentucky. So the mouth. Uh, and the book of Revelation talks about the beast. And one of the characteristics of the beast is his mouth. So if you look at Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13, verse 2, John says, And the beast which I saw was like to a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his, what's the next part? His mouth. Right, his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. So God mentions his mouth. And if you uh, go down to verse 5, it talks about the kind of words that come out of his mouth. Verse 5 says, There was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, uh, evil words, proud words, self-exalting words come out of the mouth of the beast. Verse 6 says he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So the Lord really zeroes in on, on the mouth part. Can you see that? I mean, it's there in many different, many different verses. Uh, this is a parallel to the book of Daniel where the little horn comes out of the fourth beast in Daniel 7, and he also has a mouth speaking great things, a little horn with a big mouth. Now, when you go to Revelation chapter 14, instead of the beast and the mouth, and I probably should mention that also in Revelation uh, chapter 3, it says eventually the whole world is going to follow this beast, all that dwell upon the earth, almost everyone. There's one group that doesn't follow the beast, those whose names are in the book of life. And in chapter 14, we have a new group introduced. 14 verse 1 says, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I talked about this last night, that the majority of the world are going to be reflecting the characters of the beasts whereas God is going to have a different group of people who are on the side of Jesus, on the side of the Lamb, and his name is in their foreheads, which represents his character has been written inside of their minds and inside of their hearts. And that's what they reveal. And then verse 2 says, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So here's this this big choir, and you guys sounded good tonight as you were singing, and the, the uh, singers sounded good too when you sang, and everybody sounded good, but can you, can you imagine one of these days uh, getting up there and being part of a heavenly choir? I mean, it's going to be beyond our imagination, the music of heaven, and what's happening is here is uh, a people have been developed and the choir is singing, and this group is singing. There's a voice of many waters. There's a voice of great thunder. There's the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And I think the reason why nobody can learn that song is because nobody's been through exactly what they've been through 
during Earth's final crisis. Uh, it's amazing time they're going to be going through. We're going to be going through. Verse 4 says, These are they which were not defiled with women, which uh, ladies doesn't mean there's anything wrong with being a, a woman. This is actually talking about the women of Babylon in Revelation 17, the mother and her daughters representing false churches, that these people are not defiled by those women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So here's this group, this group called the 144,000. And Revelation really zeroes in on them and describes their characteristics. They've got God's name in their foreheads. They're singing a song. They've been through something that uh, nobody else has, has ever been through. They're followers of Jesus, following the Lamb wherever he goes. And then in verse 5, there's one more characteristic. It's like the crowning, the crowning characteristic of this group. Verse 5 says, And in their mouth was found no guile. Now, do any of your Bibles have uh, in the margin a different word from the word guile? Okay, deceit. Anybody else have anything? Uh, okay, falsehood. Right, in their mouths, there's no deceit, there's no falsehood, and then it says, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So it seems like, as I look at this and as I read it, it seems to me that God puts their, their mouths at the top of the list as the final frontier that they have conquered, that final frontier, and now they are without fault before the throne of God. Which tells me that we have some work to do, or Jesus has some work to do in our lives to get us ready now, it's interesting as you look at this verse, <clears throat> verse 5, the mouth is right up there <clears throat> at the top of the list. And it says, in their mouth was found. Found. And that tells me that somebody was looking. Somebody was really looking closely to see what are the words that come out of their mouths. Uh, it reminds me of a text in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where it says that there will be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was an, a nation. And then it says, at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. In other words, uh, the angels are looking. They're looking at the books. And they find a group of people whose names are in the books. And those are the ones that are delivered. And in Revelation 14, verse 5, it seems to me that there's uh, somebody looking. I think it's, uh, it's the loyal universe. The loyal universe of heaven, the angels. They're looking to see this people, this amazing people that has been developed, and even their words uh, have been so changed by the grace of God that there was found in their mouths how much guile? None. None. You ever heard the expression that sometimes parents say to their kids, uh, what part of the word no don't you understand? So this verse says there was no guile, none, not, not anything left. And then it says, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, this is, there's an obvious answer to this question. It's not a hard question I'm going to ask you, but were these people born without fault? No. No. During their lives, 
did they live their entire lives without fault? No. In other words, these people were faulty. And their words were not without fault, probably for quite a while in their lives. But God worked with them. Jesus worked with them. The Holy Spirit worked with them. He kept on working with them. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And the Lord kept working and working and working, refining, 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 convicting, 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 until finally his goal was reached. And his goal is that in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Seems like that's the last step in the ladder. And that tells me that what happens inside of our mouths, and I'll talk about this as we go deeper, which also is really connected to what's happening inside of our hearts. Uh, this is a big issue to the Lord. He's very concerned about the things that we say, especially in an age of social media, when people are posting and responding and commenting uh, all over the place. You know, on TikTok and YouTube and Facebook. And you've probably noticed that there's a, a lot of, what's the word? There's a lot of action going on in social media these days. Have you noticed? There's a lot. And at Whitehorse Media, our ministry, uh, we get a lot of posts. People go onto our YouTube channel, they go onto our Facebook page. And we are doing our best to, to, uh, to work this technology to get the message out to the world. Social media can be dangerous, but it can also be a huge blessing. And thank the Lord, our White Horse Media YouTube channel recently crossed the 10 million mark. There, are t uh, there have been 10 million people that have viewed our programs. And uh, we are, we're, we're working on TikTok and Instagram, and we're just trying to work them all or at least as many as we can get on, and posting uh, little videos, longer videos, links, websites, articles, and pointing people to the Word of God. That's our goal. Point people to Jesus, to the Bible, to the end times. And I think we should be using all this technology that we can to get the message out, because times have changed. We live in a, in a different time compared to 50 years ago, uh, and, and just, you know, people are scared to go outside of their houses in many places. They don't want to go outside. It's expensive to buy gas, and it's dangerous in some places. And that's what more and more people are thinking. And so they're online. They're, they're watching videos. They're searching for answers. Uh, hopefully, many of them, more of them, will find uh, White Horse Media has a brand new uh, Bible school online, and you can find it by going to whitehorsemediabibleschool.com. And it's free, and it's a whole series of Bible studies, and what we're doing is we're trying to uh, get people's attention through social media and then direct them to our Bible school. That's our goal. So anyway... Um, <coughs> Many of us are out there posting and recording and talking and communicating uh, with people. And we do this through email. We do this through texts. And, and you know what that's like? I don't think that you know, we need to be careful that these things don't uh, take too much a part of our lives, that's for sure. But we still need to be out there. And what we post and what we say and what we, we record and what comes out of our mouths and what we write is very, very important. The Lord's very concerned about these things. Let's, uh, let's go through some Bible verses. Turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We're going to look up a lot of verses. James chapter 3. 
<clears throat> talks about the mouth and the tongue. James talks about a lot of different things. Verse 2, James 3, verse 2 says, For in many things we offend, we offend all. And if any man offend not in word, the words that come out of his mouth or her mouth, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So it's the same idea as in Revelation, that if you can get to the point where by God's grace, your words are controlled, according to this text, that's the path to developing uh, a, a perfect character or a godly character or a righteous character. If we can control the tongue, we can control the whole body. Uh, verse 7 says, Every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea has been tamed by mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. Yikes. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith, or with the tongue, we bless God, even the Father. And therewith, we curse men, which are made after the likeness or similitude of God. James says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. So evidently, they're, the people that he's describing are people that praise the Lord. They bless the Lord. When they think about God, they bless him. But when they think about certain other people, they say bad things about those people. You, know? you praise God, but they curse men. And then James says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. This should not be. We should be praising God, yes. But when we talk about people, even people that are off track, people that are doing things that are wrong, you know, people that are um, you know, even being led by the devil, we still need to be careful what we say about other people, right? It's very important, very, very important. It's part of the steps to reaching the final stage of being without fault before the throne of God. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And I'll just tell you that the Lord has, he's been really doing a work inside my heart. He's convicted me of a lot of things. And one thing he's convicted me about is to be very careful what I say about other people. It's been a big focus of the Lord's work in my life. It used to be when I first became a Christian, uh, there was... Well, actually, before I became a Christian, I had a language problem. Words came out of my mouth that were not wholesome words. But the Lord, uh, when I became a Christian, he worked on that. And so now I don't use, I stopped using bad words. But then he worked with me on what I say about other people. You know, he, he started going down there, too. And he just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper, farther and farther and farther. And we need a conscience that is sensitive to the Holy Spirit convicting us. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Jesus said, but I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words, 
you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. That's a pretty straightforward text. And these are the words of Jesus. Now, he's not saying we get to heaven by our words. You know, if we just say the right things, uh, we'll be saved, versus saying the wrong things, we'll be lost. And there's other verses that we'll look up as well that balance this out. But Jesus is definitely very clear that words will be taken into account in the day of judgment. God looks at our life, he looks at what we do, and he looks at what we say. He looks at the words that come out of our mouths. It's very much a part of this. Now, here's another text, uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, you probably read the, the uh, parable that Jesus told about the, the nobleman that went into the far country, and he gave his servants pounds or money or talents. And then one of them, and he, he told them to occupy until I come, verse 13, and uh, one of them took his uh, one pound and he traded and made 10 pounds. That's a pretty good return on, on your investment. That's a thousand percent return from one to 10. And then another person uh, took his one pound in verse 18, and he made five pounds. And the Lord was very pleased with both of these people because they used their, their gifts, they used their talents for the Lord. And then, but there was finally one, one man, and he decided that he was going to take his one pound and he was going to put it under a napkin and he was going to hide it because he was afraid uh, verse 21, he says, I feared you. And he begins to say different things about God. He was blaming God. He blamed him as for being a harsh man. He said, you're a, you're a hard man. Is the Lord really a hard man? Is God a, uh, a, a hard person to please? No. You know, God... God loves us, and if you think about your children, do you want your children to grow up thinking, you know, it's really hard to please mom and dad? No, of course you don't want that. You know, you want to, you have a high goal for your children, but you're patient with them, and you work with them, and you love them, and, and if they fall down when they're starting to walk, then you're so glad that they started walking in the first place. And that's the way God is. But this man had a totally, totally wrong concept of God. I feared you because you are an austere man. And in my Bible, it says you're exacting or you're harsh or you're rigid. Sometimes I think we, we can get into that track. And we think God is uh, he's just out to get us. He's always looking for something wrong. And that's not true. And God loves us and he wants to get us into heaven. He doesn't want to keep us out. That's why he sent his son. That's why Jesus came down here and gave everything. It's because he loves us and he wants us in, not out. But anyway, this person had a totally wrong concept of God. I feared you because you are an exacting man. You take up where you did not lay down, and you reap where you did not sow. In other words, he's saying, you're not fair. You're not fair to people. You're, you're asking more than you should be asking. And notice in verse 22, the, the, the Lord said to that man, it says, and he said to him, out of your own mouth, will I judge you? Out of your own mouth, you wicked servant. It's a pretty solemn text, wouldn't you say? The Lord says, out of your own mouth, I'm going to judge you. Jesus says, um, don't judge, or you'll be judged. 
He says, in the same way that you judge others, you're going to be judged. Out of your own mouth, I'll judge you. The way you treat others, God says, that's the way I'm going to treat you. If you forgive others, you'll be forgiven. But if you don't forgive, then he says, your heavenly father will not forgive you. The golden rule is to do to others as we would want them to do to us. So we need to be very careful what we say about other people and about the Lord. We don't want to give the impression that God is, uh, is so strict and so harsh and so exacting that he's really not um, you know, a joy to be around. That's not true. None of that's true. But that's the way some people think. And that's the way they speak. They speak what they think. <clears throat> Luke 6, 45. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Luke 6.45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his, heart, of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. And then he brings it home and says, For of the abundance of the heart... Then what happens? The mouth speaks. Right, so when Jesus said, by your words you'll be justified, or by your words you'll be condemned, and when he said to that man, out of your own mouth I will judge you, here he's clarifying that what comes out of the mouth is really coming from the heart. So body parts. We've got the ears, we've got the hair, we've got the feet, we've got uh, many different parts, the eyes. The Bible talks about a lot of things. And when it zeroes in on the mouth, it's because what comes out of the mouth originates in the heart. So the Lord really, if he's going to clean up our mouths, what does he have to clean up? He has to clean up the heart, right? Uh, today, I had a, a very nice tour of the school and learned more about the history of, uh, or I guess not the school, but the campus and the farm and the lifestyle center. And at one point, we were driving through the farm. And I don't know, is Andrew in this room? I don't see him, but I guess he's in charge of the farm. Is, is that right? Andrew's in charge of the farm? And we were talking, because I have some fruit trees, and we were talking about uh, why my trees have aphids on them, <laughs> at least some of my trees, especially one cherry tree. One particular cherry tree is a sweetheart cherry tree. Last year, I tell you, the aphids just did a terrible number on my tree. And this tree is still very much alive, and I checked it the other day, and I saw lots of little buds getting ready to pop out, and I'm hoping for a lot of cherries. And I know I've got to get those aphids because they're going to come back with a vengeance. When they like those new little leaves that are coming out and they just swoop onto that tree. And Andrew made a very uh, specific point. He said, if you really want to get the aphids, you've got to strengthen the immune system of the tree by giving the tree lots of good nutrition that's going to go into the soil. And when the roots get the nutrition, from the soil down deep, it's going to have some kind of tree ability to, uh, to not be so susceptible to the aphids. Does that make sense? If you want to have good fruit, you've got to have a good root, good root system. That's basic agriculture, basic gardening. Um, I think it was la last year. We have in our, in our backyard, we have five acres up in the mountains in Idaho, and I have a garden that's all fenced in because of the deer, and I have some fruit trees there, and I have my garden, and I have a compost pile. I've got my compost pile. 
And uh, last year, I took a whole bunch of our food scraps from our bucket. We have a bucket of food scraps next to our, just right outside our, our door in our kitchen. And I take my food scraps, and last year, I put a whole bunch of them uh, on my compost pile. And I tell you, things just grew out of that compost pile you wouldn't believe. Uh, and I got this gigantic squash, squash plant, that just, I couldn't have planted that kind of squash plant in the garden. <laughs> I mean, it was so big, and I had all the squash that was coming out, and I was, I was giving them to my neighbors because I had way too many squash. And it all came because all the, all the nutrients that was in that bucket went onto the compost pile, and the worms just came and just had a great time. And I, I bury, you know, I, I put some dirt on top of the food scraps, and wow, things just grew out of there. And I, I learned from that something. And now what I do is, I, and I did this last year too, I take a lot of my food scraps that are in my buckets, and I take uh, my shovel, and I squish them down, and then I pour them right into my raised beds just straight on, and I cover them. So this is a, probably in about a, maybe two weeks, the snow will be just off my four raised beds, and then I'll be able to take uh, probably four buckets of food scraps that have been building up over the winter months, and I'm gonna take them and I'm gonna, I'm gonna dump them right on top of my raised beds, and then I'm gonna put some dirt on top. And this is still probably a month or maybe a month and a half away from planting because it's, I like to plant right in the soil when it gets warm enough, at least things like kale and peas and things that are hardy, lettuce. And I've learned that if you put the food scraps right on the bed and cover them with dirt, uh, last year I went around and I used my fork and I used my shovel to try to keep the ground turning over and the worms were just popping out. They were just popping right out of the ground. And I learned that's a great way to fertilize the soil. So the point is, if you fertilize the soil, and if the soil is good, then the plants are going to grow. They're really going to grow. And it's the same way with our mouths. If, the, if God can get a hold of the heart, and if he can change the heart, which is like the root system underneath the ground, this is underneath, you know, you can't see my heart, but you can see my mouth. I can see your mouth, but I can't see your heart. And if God can get into your heart and change your heart the way he wants to, then what's going to come out of your mouth is going to be different. Isn't that right? So it's heart work with Christ. That's what he really wants to focus on. Now turn to Mark chapter 7. What's in the heart? Mark chapter 7. Verses 21 to 23. 21 to 23, Mark 7. Jesus said, For from inside, out of the heart of men, proceed, and here's a whole list of things that are not flattering, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, or my Bible in the margin says sensuality, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from inside and defile the man. Wow. Is there anyone in this room that when you look at you, this list, you know, you, th you, you don't, th or you think that I don't have any of those problems? <laughs> Anybody? I don't think so. A lot of times people say, I don't, people don't read the Bible because they don't think it's true. But the reality is, the Bible reads them, and it tells the truth. There's not a human being on this planet that if they honestly look at this list, 
It's just, it goes right to the heart, right inside, and God is telling us this is what's inside of people. And we all have these problems. And these are, if it's for me, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, so out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if, if we are going to get to the point where out of our mouths is no deceit, then obviously God has to get down to the heart and clean it up. Does that make sense? He's got to go down deep. Some people say, well, I don't have these problems. Not me. Well, then I would say, have you read where it says pride is one of those things that comes out of the heart? Yeah, you know, you look at all the things that are happening in this world, the adultery, fornication, murder, thefts, blasphemy. And really, it's, it's, it's a heart issue. That's where, you know, that's where the, the real problem lies. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. I was just reading this verse just a couple days ago, and I thought, I'm going to share this text when I get to Yuchi Pines. Proverbs chapter 7. No, I'm sorry, chapter 8. Yeah, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 7. And eight. Now, in this verse, the Lord is talking as uh, wisdom. Wisdom is talking. God is talking. And in verse, actually, we can read verse six. It says, Here, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak what? Yeah, God says, my mouth will speak the truth. You probably noticed that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over and over again, when Jesus speaks, he says, truly, truly, or some versions say, verily, verily, which really means truly, truly, I say to you. And what he's really is he's doubling up and he's saying, I'm telling you the truth. What I'm telling you is true. Jesus is the only person who's ever lived who when you look at his life and look at his teachings and look at what he said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he never said one thing wrong. He's the only person who's ever done that. There's never been a human being in this world. Jesus told the, uh, the Pharisees, he said, which one of you can convince me of sin? What have I done? What have I said? And they had to make up all these false accusations. Well, he said this and he said that, but it says none of them could prove any of their accusations because Jesus always spoke the truth. My mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverse in them. There's our example. There's the shining light that shines light to every person in the world. It's a, it's a human being that never lied. It's a human being who always speaks the truth. Everything Jesus says is the truth. There's nothing crooked. My Bible says uh, froward, and in the margin it says crooked or perverse. In other words, when Jesus speaks, he doesn't go off where he's exaggerating a little bit or he's stretching the facts or he's, you know, saying something that isn't really exactly right, he's always, he's always telling the truth. Now, here's a very uh, amazing quote. I asked, I asked uh, 
somebody to find me a copy of the little book, The Mount of Blessings. And on page 68 of this book, listen to this. It says, um, in commenting upon the actions and the motives of another, who can be certain of speaking the exact truth? How often pride, passion, personal resentment color the impression given as we speak about others. A glance, a word, an intonation of the voice may be vital with falsehood. Even facts may be so stated as to convey a false impression. Whatsoever is more than truth is of the evil one. Because Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. For anything beyond that is of the evil one. Yes, you have a comment? This is um, Thoughts on the Mount of Blessings. And in this book, it's page 78, but in the, uh, there's a little brackets there that says page 68. So this particular book, it's actually page, in this book, it's page 78. In the hard, the hard cover that uh, many of us have read, that's the one that I, I, I knew of. 68 paragraph two. Okay, 68 paragraph two. Right. And then it says, listen to this, everything that Christians do should be as transparent as the sunlight. Truth is of God. Deception in every one of its myriad forms is of Satan. And whoever in any way departs from the straight line of truth is betraying himself into the power of the wicked one. Wow. So uh, it's important to have the truth. We need the truth. We need the truth on different Bible doctrines. This is very important. I believe that. But we need, we need to understand truth that goes beyond just what day is the right day for us to worship on. There are, there are deep truths in the Bible that are very, very practical. And of course, that's a practical issue too but we also need to get into the things that we say. Yet it is not a light or an easy thing to speak the exact truth. We cannot speak the truth unless we know the truth. And how often preconceived opinions, mental bias, imperfect knowledge, Errors of judgment prevent a right understanding of matters with which we have to do. We cannot speak the truth unless our minds are continually guided by him who is truth. Wow. When I read this, I just thought, oh my, Lord, I've got a lot of work to do in my life. You have a lot of work to do in my life. I want to tell you a story. And the last line here says, we have to be guided by him who is truth. I became a Christian in the year 1979. And in my, I was 20 years old, and as a teenager, I was just lost in the world of drugs and wild living. That's, I grew up in... Uh, Studio City, North Hollywood, in, in a non-Christian home, a very secular Jewish home. All my friends were into wild things as I got older. I went to North Hollywood High School, L.A. Valley College. I never read the Bible, and I was just in bad shape. I was on the way down, down fast. And... Praise God, I started reading the Bible. I shared this with you a little bit last night. And God started working in my heart. He convicted me that I needed a Savior. I needed help. And I gave my heart to Jesus when I was uh, 20 years old in a dormitory room after reading the book, The Desire of Ages. And the Lord came into my life, and I've never been the same since. And at first, it was the big things that dropped off. You know, the, uh, the marijuana and the alcohol and the discos 
and the rock and roll concerts, the big things. I knew, can't continue to do those things. But then as I went along, uh, God started working in deeper areas that I had really no clue about. I didn't really understand what God really wanted to do in my heart. And after being a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist for about six years, uh, I started having some real problems. I went to La Sierra College for three years, pastored for a year as an intern in Bakersfield, and then went to our seminary at Andrews. And uh, when I came out of the seminary and landed in San Francisco as a young pastor, uh, by that time, I was having some real problems. And I, um, I didn't understand why I was having these problems. And it wasn't because of my education. It wasn't because of my teachers. Um, overall, um, I had a good education. And I didn't really know what was going on. But I can tell you that some of the symptoms were, when I would read the Bible, it would seem like this book was kind of like a long way away. I'd read Bible verses and they didn't, they didn't sink in. I'd read uh, books like Mount of Blessings, this, uh, this book that I quoted, and it just, it was getting harder and harder to relate to this council. And I began to feel uh, a distance between me and God that wasn't there when I first became a Christian. When I first became a Christian, I felt really good and I was happy and I was so excited to be forgiven and to, be, uh, to have a new life and to have hope and to know that there was a God in heaven who loved me. But six years later, things were just falling apart and I felt very distant from God and I didn't know why. Anybody relate to that? If you, if you can relate to that, you're not alone. And, uh, and, and so what happened was the tension began to grow inside me because uh, I wanted to feel close to the Lord. I know you can't go by your feelings, but you know, you gotta have some feelings. <laughs> it's like a marriage, you know, you can't go by your feelings all the time when you're married, uh, but you gotta have some feelings. And so, um, it was just like this darkness was descending upon me and I had no idea what was going on. And I prayed about it for months. I'd pray, Lord, what's happening to me? I'm reading the Bible, but it's not penetrating. I don't sense that you're with me. I don't know what to do. I'm getting uh, discouraged. I'm confused. I've got different ideas rolling on in, around in my head. And I'm also feeling this pressure. There's a pressure that's growing inside me to just say, bye bye, bye Lord, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of struggling and I'm just gonna go back to the world. And I kept thinking, no, I don't wanna do that. But then another part of me said, you do wanna do that. You really do. Because before when you were, uh, living in the world, you weren't going through these struggles. Remember, the voice would say to me, remember when you'd go to the beach and you'd lay out in the sun and you'd go to the, the discos and you'd spend time with your friends. You didn't have these struggles. You were just footloose and fancy free. And I remembered that. And there was a part of me that wanted that life without conflict. And the, uh, the battle grew and it got more intense. And finally, when I landed in San Francisco, actually, well, I had two churches I was assigned to, uh, one church in San Francisco and another small church south of San Francisco in a town called Pacifica. I had two little churches that I was the pastor of now. Now here I've been trained as a pastor. I've been through my uh, my college years, and now I'm pastoring a church, and I'm supposed to prepare sermons to preach and to teach to my small congregations about Jesus and God's love and hope and strength and everything good. 
And I was having a real hard time with this. I said, Lord, I, what am I going to do? How can I tell my members about hope and love and joy and peace when I'm not experiencing hope and love and joy and peace? And I said, Lord, this is a problem. And so one night, I remember, I turned off the lights in, um, in my little apartment in Pacifica. I wasn't married at that time. I lived right on a, the edge of a cliff in an apartment complex, right on the edge of the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And one night, I turned off all the lights in my apartment. And I, and I got on my knees in the dark, and I prayed an earnest prayer. And I said something like this. I said, Lord, if you don't uh, do something and help me and show me the way out of this bondage and this darkness that I'm in, uh, I, I can only go so long. And if you don't hear my prayers and do something for me, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the world. I'm just going to go back out to the world because I can't handle this. And in the darkness of my desperation, and it was a very earnest prayer, it was 1986. Um, as I prayed that prayer, this little voice spoke to my conscience. This a little voice. And this is what it said. The voice said, Pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. And that was a quote from John 16, verse 13. John 16, verse 13. And Jesus said, John 16, 13, however, when he the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. And that little voice, it wasn't an audible voice. I don't, I'm not in the habit of hearing voices. It was just an inner voice in my conscience that said, pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. And at that point, I had a decision to make whether I was going to do that or whether I wasn't. And I thought about it, kind of rolled it around in my head. And uh, at that point, something very interesting happened. I had this mental image of uh, faces looking at me, a whole bunch of faces, these little faces. This was just a mental, it wasn't a vision, it was just this uh, kind of a, you know, a mental thought of all these faces looking at me and they were gritting their teeth and they were looking at me and they were scowling and they were saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And I looked at all those faces looking at me and I was thinking about whether I should pray for the Holy Spirit or not. And I remember looking back at those faces and I said, I'm going to do it. Amen. That's what I'm going to do. Amen. I'm going to start praying for the spirit of truth. Amen. And that was in 1986. And what are we in now? 2023. Now, how many years has that been? 86, 96, 106, 116. It's been about 47 years. Am I calculating that right? 30, 37, 86, 96, 106, 160. You're right, 37. 37 years. So I want to tell you that I have been praying for the spirit of truth. I've been praying for the Holy Spirit to come into my life, to come into my mind, to help me to understand. And I have been praying this for 37 years. And I do this just about every day. I've done it many times today. 
many times as I was out in the woods just a little while ago and jogging. I don't jog very fast. I just kind of plug along. My dad used to do that. I take after my dad when he was 80. He was in his 80s. He would jog around the neighborhood. And the people in the neighborhood would look at, oh, there's the old man who's just, he'd go about this fast and he'd memorize Bible verses. That's what my dad did. It was a good example for me. So today when I was out in the woods, I said, Lord, I need more of the Holy Spirit. I, I just need more of the Holy Spirit. Give me more of the Holy Spirit. I just keep praying that every day. And I've learned, and it's been a long journey. I can't tell you all the details. But as I started doing that, little by little by little, things started making sense. My confusion started going away. Bible verses that I couldn't understand, I began to understand them. And I began to be convicted of different things that became more and more real to me. My conscience started telling me, Steve, you've done this, or you've said that, or you've gone this direction, or you've gone that direction. Uh, I, I saw or heard about somebody who had a refrigerator, and you know people look, put little, little sayings on their refrigerator, little magnets, and the, this refrigerator had a little saying on it that said, Lord, I found the problem. It's me. <laughs> and then there was an answer from, from the Lord, and the answer was, my child, I have the answer. It's me. <laughs> and as I started praying for the Holy Spirit and, and continuing to do that for the spirit of truth, God, give me the spirit of truth. Little by little, I began to see that my problem was not my education. It wasn't my teachers. It wasn't primarily my roommate. The problem really was Steve Wahlberg. I was the problem. It was in my heart. There were things in my heart that I didn't see, that I didn't understand. And little by little, when I saw those things, then I had another uh, choice to make. And the choice is, am I going to confess that to you and ask you to, to cleanse me from these things? Or am I going to hold on to them? And praise the Lord, the desire to follow Jesus won out. And when God shows me something, even though it's, it's hard to, you know, they say that the two hardest words in the human language are, guess what? I'm sorry. Um, those are the two hardest words to admit that you've made a mistake, that you've done something you shouldn't have done. And, I, and the Lord has helped me, praise his name, to uh, step by step by step, as I keep praying for the Holy Spirit, to help me to understand his truth, his word, my heart, the things that are in my heart, the pride, the foolishness, the wickedness, all the things that we saw on that list, those unflattering things, to be honest with myself, and with God, and sometimes with others, if I need to be, if I've made a mistake and I need to make something right with somebody, the Lord has just convicted me and said, Steve, say you're sorry, acknowledge your sin, and give it to me and trust in me. Trust in me. And I've been doing this for 37 years. And today, today I had a great day. <laughs> uh, out in the woods, sitting in the sauna, taking that hot and cold shower, getting my tour of uh, the farm and different places, the Lifestyle Center, reading my Bible, praying, getting ready to, to share these things with you, laying out in the sun for a little while. I tell you, God has just been so good to me. He's changed my life. He, and he's changed me more than once. He changed me when he first came into my life in 1979, in 1986, when I went through a terrible dark time and I started praying for the Holy Spirit, he changed me again. 
And a few years ago, I went through another terrible crisis where I was having problems sleeping at night. Um, and I went, I started, my life started unraveling. I got depressed. I felt like I had no hope. Um, everything was dark. I went to Weimar. I went through Dr. Nedley's program. And, uh, and God held on to me and taught me through all these struggles that I can trust in his word Amen. no matter what. Amen. No matter what, I can trust him that he's going to bring me through. Amen. And I guess there was some chemical issues inside my head that I didn't understand. But through going through that uh, lifestyle program, like you offer here, the Lord saved me a third time. 1979, 1986, 2017, 2019. And uh, God has taught me through my struggles and my battles that he is faithful, that his word is faithful, and that one of the greatest needs that I have as a human being is to pray for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. And I want to eventually end up like the 144,000 in Revelation 14, who in their mouth was found no deception because they are without fault before the throne of God. That's a goal I have, is to let the Lord bring me to the final stage where I'm fully ripe for the picking, like fruit on a fruit tree. And I am ready. I'm ready for heaven. That's my goal. Look at Luke. I've got a few more verses to share with you. Look at Luke 11, 13. And as God has taught me all these things, I've learned to be very careful what I post on social media. I've learned to be very careful what I speak in front of an audience. I've learned to be very careful what kind of video we put out as a ministry. What I say when I send out my e-newsletters to those that are part of the White Horse Media that are on my uh, e-newsletter list. What I post, post on Facebook. And when people write me sometimes uh, nasty emails, I, I've learned to be very careful how I reply. Amen. Jesus said, don't just, you know, or, or Peter said, uh, not uh, railing for railing, or don't accuse just because they're accusing you, but take the high road. Take the high road. I think Warren Buffett once said, take the high road in life. It's not, cr it's not crowded. <laughs> Good line from that old man. Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus said, if you then being evil, being evil, and that's what we are by nature. We are evil by nature. But yet we still know how to give good gifts to our children. I've got two children and there's nothing that I wouldn't give for my kids. I love my kids so much and I pray for them every day. Amen. You know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? God is not a tyrant. He's not an exacting, rigid uh, being like that one man who buried his talent thought. God is a loving Father who cares for us more than we care for our kids. And he said, if you who are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, he said, Jesus said, how much more shall your heavenly father who's not evil, who loves you more than you love your children, give, and what will he give? He'll give the Holy Spirit to them that do what? To them that ask him. Now let me ask you, here's a very simple quiz question. With what part of your body do you ask? for the Holy Spirit. It's your mouth, right? It's your mouth. So you and I, we all need to make decisions if we're gonna follow this text to open our mouths 
and to ask Jesus for the Holy Spirit to come in and to guide our lives. If we're ever going to be that people in Revelation 14 who in their mouths is no deceit, the only way in their mouths there's no deceit is because they're guided by the spirit of truth. That's the only way that can happen. And the only way that our hearts and our lives and our minds can be cleaned up so that we speak the truth like Jesus does. The only way for that to happen is through the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth who will guide you into all truth. There's no other way. It can't happen any other way. We come to the Father through the Son and we pray for the Holy Spirit to help us and to guide us. Boy, I've got a couple more texts. Is it all right if I give you a couple more texts? Yes. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 9 and 10 says, If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So with the mouth we ask for the Holy Spirit, and with the mouth we say, Lord Jesus, you are my only hope. I confess that you are my savior, that you are the one that I'm trusting in, that you are the one who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead, that you are the one who loves me, that you are the one that can get me through all the devils and all the demons and all the problems of this life and finally get me so I can stand before the throne of God. Lord, there's no way that I can do this on my own. It's just not possible. But you, Jesus, you can do it. And he says, the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And salvation is the, is the fullness of what God wants to do for us. He wants to change our lives and he wants to ultimately help us to be like him. Psalm 34, I've got three more texts. Psalm 34, verse 1. 34, 1. I'll tell you a great thing to do with your mouth. Psalm 34, verse 1. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear and be glad. Praise God. He wants us to use our mouth and our lips and to praise him. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 15, and then we'll go back to Revelation 14. Revelation 19, verse 15. When Jesus comes... Something's coming out of his mouth. In Revelation 19, verse 15 says, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And what is the sharp sword? It's his word. That's right. Now, if the nations weren't so out of harmony with Jesus, if they weren't, so full of pride and wickedness and deceit and murder and all the things that the world's doing right now, if the world wasn't so full of those things, when Jesus comes and speak, there'd be no problem. But it's because they're so out of harmony with truth and with 
purity and righteousness that the words that come out of his mouth, they smite the nations. See that? That's why. It's because, not because he, he enjoys that, but it's because they are out of harmony with his word. Revelation 14, verse 5. And then there's actually one last text before we pray. I'll take you to in Psalm 141, verse 3. Revelation 14. One of these days, God's work is going to be done. One of these days, he will accomplish his purpose of preparing a people who are ready for the coming of the Lord. They're ready for earth's final crisis, and they're ready for the second coming. Verse 1, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. There's this huge crescendo of music. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, the women of Babylon, for they are virgins. They're, they're totally on Jesus' side. They want no other lovers. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Because even if you have, you know, as they have faults, as they see their defects, as they see their words and things that are not right, they still follow the Lamb. They say, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, change me. Lord, help me. Lord, wash me. Make me clean. You still love me even though I'm a mess. Lord, you love me even though I'm a mess. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, no deception, they speak the truth. They don't lie. They don't say things about people that aren't true. They, they are cautious. They check their impulses. They don't just pour out words about other people without thinking carefully about what they say. And if they're not sure about a certain situation, they don't talk as if they know what they don't know. That was Peter's problem. And they don't do that. They're very careful about what they say and what they post and what they write. In their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This shouldn't discourage us. It should inspire us. Lord, through your grace, you can do this for me. You can get me there. And those who get to that point are not going to be um, sad that they're worshiping a rigid, exacting, tyrannical God. No, they're not. Their mouths are going to be full of praise that Jesus has been so good to, you, to them and that he's cleaned up their lives and help them by his grace to become like him. Amen. Okay, last text, Psalm 141, verse 3. Kind of scared to know, to ask you, have you ever heard of this as a song? Because I'm, I'm not going to lead out in it. I'm not a, a good singer. But there was an old pastor once before he died, he taught us a song based on verse 3. Or yeah, Psalm 141, verse 3. Have you ever heard this song? Set a watch. Set a watch, O Lord. 
before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. You probably never heard that song. Huh? Well, I'm not going to try to sing it. Since if you all knew it, maybe we would do it. But since you don't know it, I'm not going to do it. But anyway, it was a little song, scripture song based on this verse. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Amen. And if, if, that, uh, if God does that, we'll be on our way toward being a people that eventually, in their mouths, there's no deceit for they stand without fault before the throne of God. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, the Lamb, our Savior, our coming King, we pray to you. Thank you for, for your word. Thank you for the Bible study we've had tonight. And we do pray as a group for the Holy Spirit, for the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth and help us to become people of truth, people whose mouths speak the truth like Jesus did. So no wickedness or abomination or falsehood uh, is found in our lips. Lord, please help us and guide all of us and guide us step by step. If there are people here in this, in this group that are struggling with uh, deep conflicts inside their souls, Lord, help them to realize that you have the answer to those problems. And in Pray for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to guide them into all truth so you can help them and get them through these, these battles. And be with all of us. Give us a good night's sleep tonight and help us to find the joy of knowing you and of following the Lamb wherever he goes. In Jesus' name, amen.